John chapter 15, that famous chapter that we all know so well about abiding in Jesus. And especially in times like this, you know, abiding in Jesus and having him as our defense and our refuge and our strong tower and the one that we run to when we're afraid, the one that we run to when we're in doubt, the secret place that we run to when we're confused and don't know what to do. That's the abiding place that we can find in Jesus. And so let's let's read through this a little bit and see exactly what Jesus was calling us to. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine. He's, uh, he's not thinking this up or making this up on his own. You know, throughout the Old Testament, God referred to Israel as his vine and as his garden. And so when he, when Jesus says here, I am the true vine, you know, and, and we are the branches, what he's talking about there is the fact that we get our life from him. And just like the leaves and the flowers and the branches on the tree, they draw the sap and the life from the branch, from the trunk, from the roots, from the ground. And it's uh, something that can't be seen or observed with the, with the naked eye, with the natural eye. I'm sure now they probably have something, some digital camera or device that can see inside. But, you know, to the natural eye, it's something we don't see happening. But yet the fruit is so obvious. You know, this a tree or a vine that's alive and it's lush with green leaves and it's bearing fruit, it's unmistakably alive. And the, the life sap is flowing through it. Jesus, in John chapter 14, verse 13, said, Jesus said to her, to the woman at the well, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Talking about those who try to find their satisfaction or their purpose or their fulfillment in this life. It's all vanity. Every, everything we see in this world system is vanity. Yes, things like family and relationships and grandkids and our spouses, they can bring us great joy. Absolutely. But as great as those things are and those relationships are, you know, not even your spouse can make you happy. Oh, they can make life here on earth a lot of fun and bring a lot of happiness, but they don't satisfy that need for God that's deep in every heart. Grandchildren can't make you fulfilled, can't bring you purpose. The closest relationships that you have, the, the joys of what other, whatever uh, leisure time or hobbies that you like to partake in, none of that will make you happy or satisfied. And Jesus says that. He says, anyone who drinks of this natural water or of this natural world, you're just going to be thirsty again because it doesn't bring you the, the joy. You and I were made for God. And without having a relationship of abiding in him, we'll never be happy, never truly happy. And Jesus goes on and he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him, will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You and I have access to a source of joy and peace and divine fulfillment and satisfaction that is eternal. There's no end. It never grows weaker. It never grows old but it is continually renewed in our hearts. That's the kind of water we want. And Jesus said, I am the one that will give you that eternal life, that living water. And that's what it means when it says that he is the vine. He is the one that we're satisfied in. He is the one who is our peace. He's the one who brings us joy. He is the one that touches 
the deepest need in our heart, that need for God. And so as we abide in him and continually draw from that life, it's just like the branch that's drawing its life from the vine. So I put there in your notes for tonight, abiding in the vine is that continuity of relationship. It starts with regeneration. And when I say continuity of relationship, we're talking about hourly. We're talking about daily. But even beyond that, we're talking about through the years. Those of you who have known the Lord and served the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years, you have no idea of the rich heritage that you have. I don't think we always appreciate it the way that we should. And you have such a rich heritage of knowing God and walking with him just like Enoch did. And so we're talking about that continuity as well. The continuity of a life that doesn't give up or turn away from following God. We abide in him and it's a lifelong commitment. Well, then he goes on and he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser, the one who cares for it. I think probably everybody online knows what it's like to have a garden, knows what it's like to have a yard. Paul and Helen know what it's like to have a really big yard and to care for all of that land. And so, Isaiah chapter 5 is one of those places I was referring to that talks about uh, God caring for his garden, which is his people, and how much joy and rejoicing and effort he puts into it. He says here in verse 1, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, cleared it of stones. So he dug it. He dug out all of the roots and the stubble and the stumps and the, he cleared it of stones. He wanted to make the ground as, as uh, soft and good ground as possible. Took out all of the rocks. He planted it with choice vines, the very best. He gave this garden of his the very best. Does that sound like a gardener that you know? Our Heavenly Father. He built a watchtower in the midst of it to protect it from wild animals, from those that would come. How frustrating is it when you, uh, when you grow a vegetable garden and all the rabbits or all the deer come through and just eat everything? So he built a watchtower to protect it. He hewed out a wine vat in it for the juice, the wine. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. That is the sad, sad story of human nature. We have a God who so lovingly, tenderly, so joyfully gives us the very best, and yet we still rebel. And we still go after other lovers. And we have a wild heart instead of a thankful heart, instead of a submissive heart. He says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for my vineyard that I have not done in it? What more was there to do? What more could I have done for this garden, my people? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Why were they rebellious? Why, you know, it just, all of that goodness and prosperity that I bestowed upon them went straight to their head and they thought they were self-sufficient. It was, they thought it was all because of them. And, uh, they just went wild in their heart rebels, wanting to do it their way and do their own thing and giving themselves the credit and the glory. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue 
to rebel. Haven't you learned the consequences of sin? And haven't you learned the consequences of your pride? It always comes before a fall. And you will be struck down again and again until you learn the lesson. And you and I are just like little children. When you're raising that two-year-old, that three-year-old, that four-year-old, there's one thing that gets their attention, and I think we've all experienced it. Pain. Pain that's administered in love. Pain that is in no way abusive, but corrective. Pain that is instructive in that it teaches a lesson. And you know, you can sit that child down and preach a sermon to them of 45 minutes of why what they did was wrong and they just aren't going to get it. But the pain they get, and so he says, until you learn the lesson, you will be continually struck down. And this is after our gardener, our vine dresser, has given us everything he could possibly give us. He says here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. Do not regard it lightly. Take it seriously. Realize God is disciplining you to spare your life, to save you from hell to spare you from the destruction of your sin. And every one of us, if all we get is just a pile of blessings from God, we will forsake him. And we need the pain of the trial to bring us back into line. So that we learned, that hurt the last time I did this. I don't think I'll do that again. So he says, don't regard it lightly, and then don't be weary. Don't give up. Don't just say, I'm so sick and tired of people telling me what to do. Don't be weary. Learn from it. Change. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. So every one of us go through these times of discipline. In fact, if the truth be known, we're probably in some form of discipline from the Lord every day of every year because he's always, he's always working with us. He's always looking after us. He's always seeing where we stray to the left and to the right and he disciplines us to get us back on center. He disciplines the one that he loves. Verse 2 says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, you know, if you are a strict Orthodox Calvinist, you're going to have trouble with verse 2. Because look at what he says. He says, Every branch in me. The only way that you can really interpret that is every branch in relationship with me. And so he says here, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. You won't remain in relationship with the Lord. And I, you know, I, I can say it this way. The only reason that I believe a Christian can lose their salvation is because God says so. And if he didn't say so, I wouldn't believe it. And the reason why I say that is I just look at my own life and I think if anyone deserves the judgment of God, it's me for things that I've done in the past. And to think that he would still love me and forgive me and restore me is just so so far more than anything I deserve that based upon personal experience, I would have to say, 
I don't think you can lose your salvation. But when I read things like verse 2, I have to admit, yeah, that's what it says. A Christian can lose their salvation. So if God didn't say it, I wouldn't believe it. But since he says it, then we have to acknowledge this is a reality that we have to be careful of. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's the fruit that comes from the sap, from the life within the branch. And so this isn't fruit, this isn't good works that you somehow kind of generate through self-discipline. This is fruit that can only come by the Holy Spirit. This is fruit that you are completely incapable of producing. This is fruit that has to come by God alone. He says here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and he, he gets so repetitive here. It, it's almost like the author knew that someday there is going to be this big fight between Calvinists and Arminians. And so he's saying, let's see, how can I make this abundantly clear? These are people who have been once enlightened. These are people who have tasted the heavenly gift. These are people who have shared in the Holy Spirit. These are people who have tasted the goodness of the word of God. These are people who have tasted the powers of the age to come. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind who these people are? You know who these people are? These people are branches in Christ. Jesus said, branches in me. That's who these people are. And if these people do not bear fruit in their life, he takes them away. He says in verse 6, if they have fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. I want you to see something there in verse 6 and listen to what the word is saying. He says, if these people who have known God, if these people who have abided in Jesus at one time, in relationship with Jesus, if they fall away and willfully, deliberately turn their heart from God, they lose the ability to repent. And listen, your acts of sin are not what cause you to lose your repentance. You lose your repentance because you lose the ability to repent. You lose the ability to turn to the Lord. You lose the ability to feel godly sorrow in your heart for what you've done. And so... Many times we think, you know, oh, I've sinned one too many times, or I've sinned the big one, or, uh, you know, I've crossed the line with, with that last sin and God will never, f it's not the act, it's not the action itself that causes you to lose your salvation. It's the fact that you can no longer repent. And when you see David, you know, a, a man after God's own heart, why did God love David so much? This was a man who committed adultery. He took another man's wife. He then kills the husband and covers it up through deceit and manipulation. Now, don't you think if anybody deserves judgment, it would be that man? But we see David who creates vile sins like that being one of God's favorites. Now, how does that happen? It's because David knew how to repent. He never lost that ability to repent. 
when you sin, we can't mope around all day in self-pity and in condemnation. But you do need to pick yourself up and start doing what you know is right. And as you do that, godly sorrow will strike your heart. And you'll find yourself weeping before the presence of the Lord because of what you've done. And Corinthians says that that godly sorrow is the fuel for change. And without that godly sorrow, change is not possible. So, you know, like, like I've said in the past, when you, when you're suddenly feel guilty, be thankful that you can still feel guilt. Because people who have lost their salvation, the Bible says their consciences are seared and they can no longer feel that guilt. They no longer have the capacity to repent. And so, thank God for His chastening. Because we don't want to be removed as a branch. And if He didn't chasten us, we would surely come to the place where we would have to be taken away and gathered together and burned in the fire. And we know what that fire is. And so that's why this husbandman, this gardener called the Heavenly Father prunes us. And it hurts. And there's times of pain in our life. But those are the very wounds that cleanse away the evil. And we can be thankful for that chastening of our Heavenly Father. So I put there in your notes, these have lost their salvation not because of their sinful actions, but because they've lost the ability to repent. Losing the ability to repent is what you need to fear first and foremost. If my heart ever becomes so hard that God can no longer melt it, I'll be eternally damned. Those who are repentant are eternally secure. But what if you've lost the ability to repent? And that's the greatest danger of willful, deliberate, habitual sin is because you slowly sear the conscience and you will get to the point when you can no longer repent. There is a hardening of the heart and a searing of the conscience which renders a person incapable of repentance. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, that insists on living its own way instead of living by the sap of the vine, ends up getting take taken away. We're already out of time. Father, we, we thank you for your word to us tonight. And we pray that it would be a warning. We pray, Father, that we would never lose sight of your hatred of sin. We pray, Father, that we would never lose sight that it's our very sin that we delighted in that put Jesus on the cross to suffer and die so miserably. And Father, we see here as Jesus was teaching, he was warning against being a branch that's taken away and put in a pile to be burned. Lord, teach us how to abide. Continue to correct us and chasten us. We saw the way of, of, of the human heart to where when God lavishes all of his goodness and love upon his garden and then that garden grow, goes wild, rebellious. And so, Father, we thank you for your chastening. We thank you for those times in our life where it hurts because we need the pain. We are just like that two- or three-year-old toddler we need the pain, Father. So be faithful to chasten us, please. Because what a horrible thing to find our life in this life 
and to lose our life in the next life. Father, we give you praise and we give you honor in Jesus' name.